much, Ginger. And uh, many thanks to, to Jacques and Tommaso for some uh, very interesting and uh, thoughtful remarks on how to get platforms to, uh, to behave responsibly, uh, that is, in a way that benefits society. Uh, time is short, and so I think I'm going to be very brief in my discussion. I, I just like to uh, summarize uh, some of the points that Jacques and Tommaso made uh, from, from my point of view. I, I would say that uh, based on their discussion, there are three ways in which uh, government can try to get platforms to behave uh, in a pro-social way. Uh, the first is to pass a law that platforms must act uh, in a way that does not restrain trade. Uh, they mustn't act uh, anti-competitively. Uh, this is what uh, Jacques was calling uh, competition policy. Uh, the second is to introduce an outright ban on certain practices. For example, uh, you can make it illegal for a platform that hosts widget sellers uh, to sell its own widgets uh, on, that, on that platform. Uh, and, uh, and the third possibility, uh, which uh, uh, Tommaso had on his slides, but uh, wasn't really discussed by, by either speaker, uh, is, to, is to break the platform up and to create competition instantly, uh, since the various pieces will then be rivals uh, of one another. Uh, now, of course, historically, uh, all three strategies have been used, uh, not, not so much in the digital world, but looking more broadly, uh, at one time or another, uh, going back to the, uh, to the 20th century. Uh, so far, uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, platforms, digital platforms, uh, governments in the United States and Europe, uh, until quite recently, have have followed the first strategy. Uh, you know, you'll recall uh, that 25 years ago, uh, the U.S. government sued Microsoft, saying that bundling its software uh, was putting Netscape uh, at an unfair uh, disadvantage. Um, and in the end, Microsoft had to, uh, to stop doing this. Uh, this is the strategy that I think it's fair to say uh, economists tend to gravitate toward naturally because it's the most nuanced. That is, uh, there's a, a particular practice by a particular platform that's examined, and the costs and benefits of that, of that practice are weighed up in court. And if the costs are deemed to exceed the benefits, the company is told that it can't continue the practice. Uh, simply banning certain practices, uh, a platform selling their own products in competition with, with other sellers uh, is cruder. Uh, and no doubt, uh, it doesn't get things right all the time. There are, there are cases where the benefits of the ban will exceed the cost, but there are probably plenty of cases where it, it, it goes the other way. Uh, but as both uh, Jacques and Tommaso noted, uh, despite its crudeness, bans are increasingly becoming the strategy of choice uh, because first, they're simpler. Uh, second, they are relatively unambiguous. Uh, and third, uh, uh, they're quicker. Uh, there doesn't have to be a protracted legal battle adding up the costs and benefits. And as Tommaso was saying, uh, in too many cases, uh, in too many cases, uh, the issue became moot because the industry moved on anyway. Uh, but I think there's another reason 
uh, why we're seeing uh, a, uh, a greater emphasis uh, on, on regulation. And that is uh, a widespread feeling that the first strategy, the more subtle strategy, uh, has failed. Uh, one might have thought uh, thir nearly 30 years ago when Amazon was founded uh, that by now uh, it would have a lot of competition uh, in the e-tail business. Uh, but in fact, it has uh, surprisingly, surprisingly little competition. Now, exactly why this is the case is a uh, fascinating uh, and important question. Uh, uh, I'm particularly intrigued by the theory that uh, through learning by doing, uh, Amazon has developed software that is far better than anyone else's. And because that software is proprietary, uh, the gap uh, between Amazon and its competitors uh, remains large and, and it is perhaps growing. Uh, but um, whatever the reason uh, for Amazon's continued dominance, and same is true for Google's continued dominance and Facebook's continued dom dominance, th this leads me to the, uh, uh, to the, to the third strategy, uh, which uh, Tommaso called uh, breakup with, a, uh, with an exclamation point. Uh, I suspect that uh, regulation, ba bans are also not by themselves going to prevent the, the giant platforms like Amazon, Google, and Facebook uh, from remaining pretty dominant. Uh, and so there is going to be increasing public pressure uh, to, uh, to divide these giants up into smaller pieces. Uh, and let me now make a remark, which for an economist might be viewed as heresy. Um, I'm going to suggest that perhaps uh, this would be a good idea. Uh, and I, I'll propose two reasons. Uh, first, uh, the historical experience uh, with breaking up companies, at least in the United States, has been reasonably positive. Uh, the, the, the two big examples uh, are the breakup of Standard Oil uh, in the early 20th century uh, and the breakup of AT&T uh, in the late 20th, 20th century. And of course, in both cases, one can argue that it was a, uh, a mixed outcome, but uh, you can, uh, you can make the case, and many have, that on balance, uh, uh, both uh, benefited uh, consumers. Uh, so the historical experience suggests that breaking up uh, dominant firms uh, can, can be an effective uh, solution. But uh, perhaps an even more important point is that Quite apart from their economic power, uh, the giant platforms have enormous uh, political power. And in a, uh, in a democratic country like the United States, having that much power invested in entities that are not directly accountable to the public uh, can be worrisome. Uh, so although I celebrate as an economist, the nuance and subtlety of strategy one. And uh, I, I might even uh, endorse an, an economist, as an economist, uh, a shift towards strategy two. Um, I think it may also uh, be uh, very much worth considering the breakup strategy, strategy three as well. Thank you.